I'm Ren Tasmo, and Dante's Cove needs more gay. There's a reason that they show reruns of Buffy the Vampire Slayer on the Logo Network, and it's not just because the show has lesbian characters in it. It's because, for whatever reason, horror and fantasy really resonate with the LGBT community. Maybe it has something to do with the theme of deviation. Horror and fantasy often deals with characters who have some sort of secret that both makes them unique and puts them on the fringe of society, be it a fascination with mad science, a knightly transformation, or magical powers. Dante's Cove continues in this tradition, only it's a little, let's say, less subtle about it. It airs on the Here Network, which is sort of like the gay HBO. Essentially, Dante's Cove equals one part Buffy, one part soap opera, and about five parts softcore gay porn. Because if this show has one defining feature, it's the really long, really frequent, and really graphic sex scenes. Okay, stay with me straight guys, there's some lesbians in there too. Despite all of the ugly bumping, most of this show actually does have a legitimate story. Maybe not a very good story, but it's at least there. Sort of. Kinda. To be fair, the show actually gets a little better in the later seasons. But season 1 is a lot easier to make fun of, so let's just focus on that for now. We start out in 1840, where we meet Grace and Ambrosius. No, not that Ambrosius. All that? They're some sort of high-class couple, and they're engaged, but Grace is sort of the jealous type. Okay, she's really the jealous type. Literally, before we even get one minute in, she catches Ambrosius looking at another woman. So she melts her brain, because she can do that. Ambrosius senses her anxiety and reassures her. Grace, I can assure you, I have absolutely no interest in other women. And he's telling the truth, because it turns out he's banging the hell out of the butler. Cue our first super long sex scene which only lasts about two and a half full minutes before Grace catches them in a compromising position. There's a pretty hilarious deer in headlights moment. Huh? Though to be fair, they probably should have picked a more private location, or at least invested in some curtains. Grace casts some sort of evil melty spell and kills the butler, then gets super kinky with Ambrosius, in an angry way. What are you doing? She puts a curse on him that can only be broken by the kiss of a young man. Which doesn't seem all that bad, except that she also turns him into... Nick Nolte? Yikes. Cut to present day, where we meet Kevin, who's visiting his secret boyfriend Toby in Dante's Cove. They enjoy long walks on the beach, long sits on the beach, really long sex on the beach, and blowjobs in the back of taxi cabs. But there's trouble in paradise. Kevin hasn't come out to his parents yet, and his relationship with Toby has some other sort of non-specific tension in general. It isn't gonna work. How do you know that? Because nothing ever does. Nothing. Nothing works ever. Now let's go have sex again. No, seriously, that's pretty much what happens. Kevin goes back home to his parents, who turn out to be pretty much the worst parents ever. I'm not living in the same house with a faggot! <laughs> so after about 30 seconds, he heads right back to Dante's Cove to live with Toby. Then this happens. Kevin! Yeah, there's a lot of weird, irrelevant montages in this show, because God knows if there's one thing this show needs, it's more padding. Kevin arrives at the Hotel Dante on what appears to be Casual Friday, and meets a few of the locals, each of whom are more naked than the last. <sighs> oh, hey. <laughs> no, it's a cool watch. <laughs> he also meets Van, who fills Kevin in on the hotel's creepy history. Turns out that this used to be Grace the Witch's house, and there was also some weird incident where a couple kids mysteriously turned into piles of ash. No biggie. Meanwhile, Toby is on his way to the hotel, when he runs into a mysterious old lady, who is pretty much every mysterious old lady ever. Can you hear it? What the hell are you talking about? She even pulls a Batman disappearo on him. Toby reunites with Kevin. They celebrate by having sex for about a million years. The mood gets kind of broken, however, by this. Yeah! So after that visual cold shower, which turns out to be pointless, Van offers to show Kevin around town. He watches her swim topless, which for some reason reminds him of his abusive father? Jesus, these people have serious problems. Back at the hotel, there's some... lesbians doing... Lesbian things? You're welcome. Guy with no pants is now guy with weird shirt. Cheers to that outfit, man. Nice. Thanks. Kevin eventually ends up in the hotel's basement, and hears some weird noises coming from beneath a locked trapped door. 
He takes off the padlock, but doesn't have a chance to open it because it's time to have sex again? Seriously? Do these people even have jobs, or does this place just sustain itself on some sort of sex barter system? Whatever, Kevin has a mid-blowjob vision, beckoning him back to the trapdoor. So he ditches Toby because goddammit, someone needs to quit having sex long enough to advance the fucking plot. He finds and releases Ambrosius, who of course kisses him, breaking the curse. What a lame curse. At least make it a kiss of true love or something. Turns out that Ambrosius has magic powers too, and he forces Kevin to cut himself for no visible reason. Ambrosius is kind of a dick. The cut is apparently bad enough for Kevin to get taken to the hospital, where he starts acting like more of a douche than usual. He has a long, pointless dream about himself and Toby. But they don't technically have sex this time, they just have some sort of sexy picnic. Mysterious old lady shows up and gives Toby a photograph of Ambrosius with an important looking riddle on the back, which he immediately throws away. Smart. Ambrosius has moved into a lighthouse and he seems to have developed a thing for Kevin, because he casts some sort of spell that summons him. They get sexy for a while, and then Kevin returns to the hospital with no memory of said sexy times. Weirdly enough, who should Kevin's nurse be but Grace, looking very... Palin-esque. She does her melty eye glow spell and kills Kevin. Boo freaking who. Elsewhere, Ambrosius runs into mysterious old lady and kills the hell out of her. Her body fades away because apparently she's an enemy in a first person shooter. Toby and Van find out that Kevin's dead, cry cry cry. Ambrosius finds out too and gets pissed off at Grace, and then ends up putting the same curse on her that she put on him. <laughs> Ambrosius kisses Kevin, which brings him back to life for some reason. Toby talks to some ghost kids. The plot's really just circling the drain at this point. Hello, Toby. How do you know my- We just know lots of things. Things that are good. And things that are bad. And things that are bad. Like this show. Toby and Ambrosius both find out that Kevin's not dead anymore. Ambrosius is pissed off at Grace again because he no longer has power over Kevin. Toby has another pointless, sexy dream. Seriously, this show is so gratuitous, it's almost exhausting. Ambrosius tries to kill him with an axe, but the ghost kids appeal to his sense of guilt or something. He runs into our old friend No Pants Guy, whose name is actually Cory. Ambrosius is like, let's go have sex in my lighthouse. And Cory's like, K. Okay. And then Ambrosius makes him drink blood out of his abs. Cory becomes his magical slave and gets all sweaty and puts on a bunch of eyeliner. And then he goes and tells Kevin that Toby is cheating on him with some other guy, and has been lying to him this whole time. And he's super convincing about it, too. So he's been lying to me this whole time. Yep. Next, he goes and tells Toby that Kevin is cheating on him. Wacky misunderstandings. Van decides that this is the perfect time to break into a museum, and she finds out about the religion of Treason, which is a sort of pseudo-pagan cult that all the witches in this series belong to. She shows Toby this old magic book, and suddenly it starts going all ghostwriter on him. What should we do, evil ghostwriter? Oh, come on! Turns out the mysterious old lady is slash was Ambrosius' mom. Also, her body was found on the beach because I guess it teleported there somehow, except that they also see her in the museum, but I guess that's just her ghost? Or was she already a ghost? I don't even know anymore. They go back to look for the plot device that Toby threw away, but it's gone. Then they sneak back into the hospital to try to talk to Kevin. They confirm that nobody's cheating on anybody because that's totally relevant at this point. And they have a group hug. Group hug. <laughs> Aww. Van reads some magic words out of the spell book, breaking the curse on Kevin. And everyone celebrates with a bonfire where I guess they burn what few shirts they own. Ambrosius is pissed that no one invited him. So he and Cory knock Toby unconscious and dump him into the sea. Kevin wakes up to find Ambrosius being a creep, and old Gracie breaks free of her chains. Unsatisfying cliffhanger ending. Wee. So there's season one of Dante's Cove. Is it good? Not by a long shot. Is it at least enjoyable? Well, I guess that depends on what it is you're looking for. If you're looking for a decent horror fantasy story, it's definitely not your best option. Even if you're looking for something with a gay slant. If you're looking for porn, it's probably not your best option either, because the attempt at an actual story is probably going to distract from the important things. I guess all things considered, the best thing you can say about Dante's Cove, at least the first season, is that it's just a campy guilty pleasure. Just take whatever joy you can find in the lame acting, the cheesy effects, and of course, the gratuitous nudity. So if you're looking for naked wizards, I guess Dante's Cove is for you. Or maybe... Equus. I have to go take a shower now. Make me feel so happy.